All right. Welcome, everyone. Hey, there's Trevor. Hey, how are you doing, Jeff? Good to see you. Hey, good to see you, too. Sorry, I was just running from another session. Getting That's all, all right. Set. You're busy. You're busy. I love your Man. background, and uh, you're looking great. How was the last session? Good. It's just a drop-in hour, but you know, we've been in with teachers. Uh, Trisha and I have been with teachers since 8 o'clock this morning. Go, go, go. So, Oh, my gosh. I can tell you're standing up right now. You're not sitting. You're standing. No, no. Yeah. This is the problem. When I got a standing desk, I didn't realize it meant standing all day. That wasn't... <laughs> You know what I mean? And now, there's no middle ground. There's no middle ground. And yeah. Now, yeah. Now yeah. I spent all day, uh, all day here. So it's just crazy. Well, thank you for, for being here. I'm so excited. Uh, and I was just in a session and I even cut this session short. I was like, but we got to go listen to Trevor. You're going to oh, love thank this. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate those kind there. words. Yeah. No, yeah. any chance I could connect and share my passion for inquiry, yeah. but also, you know, re really similar context for West coast and, uh, I feel like we're so closely connected, although there's a border that divides us. It's always nice to connect with educators that are kind of somewhat local, right? So I yes. appreciate the kind yeah. invite and uh, the opportunity to share and speak and engage. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody as you're getting ready. If this is your first time joining us here on a webinar, uh, welcome. You're going to notice webinars are a little bit different than a Zoom meeting. Uh, you can't uh, turn on your camera, which is a good and a bad thing. Uh, <laughs> so you can be doing whatever you want to do. We can't see you doing it, which is great because we're after school hours and uh, you can be listening to us or kind of sort of paying attention if you'd like, but uh, you're going to want to focus in on what Trevor has to share today. I'm really excited about it. Uh, the chat is your place. That is a place for you to, to connect with each other. Uh, if you're over in the chat, uh, I'd love to hear where you're coming from today. And please make sure down at the bottom, there's a little blue button that either says panelist or panelist and attendees. And if you would change that to panelist and attendees, I'm sorry, it's not defaulted that way. I can't figure out a way to make it default that way. Uh, that allows every one of us to see your messages. So if you will share with us where you're coming from, thank you for joining us. Uh, and we're gonna get started here in uh, about five minutes. So we've got a little bit of time, but if you can uh, get set up over there, awesome. Tamley coming from Connell. That's who I was just with. This I was with Connell just a second ago. So it's great to see some of them pop over here as well. Oh, some more Connells. Oh, look at that. They're all coming over. It's great. I'll have a good time. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to see where Trisha's at too. Now, also, if this is one of your first webinars, uh, down at the bottom, there's another little button down there called Q&A, and that is where you get to ask questions. Uh, and then as Trevor's going through his stuff today, uh, we will keep our questions over there. And uh, as, the, as appropriate, we'll either bring them up uh, to Trevor as he's going through his stuff, or we can keep them to the end and, and have Trevor do a little Q&A at the end. There's Trisha. Hi, Trisha. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Hey, Trisha, good to meet you finally. Thanks for all your support and uh, getting me here and, and everything you've done. It's greatly appreciated. Oh, thanks, Trevor. We're, we're super happy to have you. And I'm just, I'm so excited to have somebody coming in and talking about inquiry from a high school perspective, because I think a lot of the time, sometimes people are like, oh, inquiry, we know it's good for kids, but what about older students? <laughs> yeah, what yeah, it the work? high school perspective, the high school perspective. You no, know, happy to share. And uh, that's something that I speak to often. And I am a high school practitioner and um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak about the scope of my work throughout our time together, but excited if there are secondary colleagues in attendance here or watching after the effect to uh, specifically, uh, you know, speak with them and connect with them. And, and you're both in Canada. How great is that? Is you that know? right, Trisha? You're in Canada. Yes, I am a newly permanent resident, so I'm not too far from you. On, I'm on uh, Gabriola Island. Oh, how lucky are you? You're so fortunate. Yeah, so I'm on Vancouver Island. I'm, I'm in Victoria, and uh, welcome. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's amazing. Now, like, the, the big island feels like such a metropolis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now that I've been here, it's like, ooh. Get to go Lots to the big people. island today. That's right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, it's a gorgeous island. Gabriola, all the Gulf Islands are spectacular. If you're a listener uh, and you haven't visited kind of north of the border, the Gulf Islands, they're all spectacular. And um, as soon as this little pandemic thing goes away, we'll, we, we'd love to have you and, you know, connect with you, whether it's a coffee or a hike or a mountain bike ride. It's a beautiful region to live and play in. So welcome, Trisha. Thanks, Trevor. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And if you're just joining us over in the in the the uh, room over in the chat, please, if you can, 
Uh, make sure that little blue button down there where you're typing in your message says panelists and attendees. Uh, that way we can all take part in the conversation and start sharing our, our own understandings and, and things we have uh, that we're trying in our classroom as Trevor is going through his, uh, his, his material today. And also you're going to want to uh, maybe open up that Q and A button. If you've never been in a webinar before, the cool, one of the cool features of a webinar that aren't in Zoom meetings is that we have this idea of a question and answer area where we can keep all of our questions together. And the cool part is you can thumb them, you can thumbs up questions. So if you're over there in the Q and A section, I'm making sure I have that turned on. Yeah, you can upvote. Um, so if somebody else puts a question in there and it's the same question that you have, you know, feel free to, to give it an upvote. Um, and I do want to mention, because Jeff, we had some questions about this last time. I know some participants felt like, okay, I've got a question. I've got to hold on to it. I don't want to put it in there while Trevor's still speaking. It, it, it's okay. Like Jeff and I are here to watch that. So he doesn't need to worry about it. And, yeah. you know, now that it's almost 4 PM, please don't feel like you have to bear the burden of that responsibility <laughs> of retaining a question. You can put it in there. And then when the time is appropriate, we'll make sure uh, that, that we discuss it. So there's no, you know, I must wait until certain moment to put in that question. As they, as they come up, it's great to just sort of see them because your question might inspire someone else's. Awesome. Yeah. All right. We've got about two minutes left here. A few more people coming in, which is fantastic. It's great to have you all join us here on a, what is it? Wednesday? Wednesday, Wednesday. afternoon. Hump day. Yeah, we lose track of the days of the week right now. They're just they're such busy times, such I busy know. days. And I'm using my planner all the time. My phone mm -hmm. is just my savior right now. I'm so thankful for any mm -hmm. kind of organizational strategy. <laughs> so you. if you have any tips or tricks, throw them in the chat. I need them. Life is busy. Yeah. I know. We, and, well, and, and you don't leave house, right? Like it's not like you're going to work yeah. or I'm not anyways. I'm not going to work. So there's not even this routine. Like yeah, it'll, all of a sudden, yeah. it'll be like two and a half weeks and I haven't left the house. And I'm just like, what the, what in the heck, you know? Yeah. We almost need some new names for new days of the weeks. Cause I feel like, I don't know about you, but I feel like there's nine days in the week now, not just seven. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> what are those extra two days in the week? Like, uh, how are you using that extra time? <laughs> that is amazing. I want some of that. That's great. So yeah, uh, anybody who's here who has a great suggestion for what we should call two more days of the week, please let us know. Yeah. yeah uh, Kathy is asking, are these recorded? Yes, they are recorded. We are we put them up on our website. Uh, it'll also be released as a podcast episode. If you're a podcast listener, uh, we try to we try to get the, the message out as, as, as far and wide as we can, uh, which is always really great. Uh, just one of the way that, that we'd like to give back to educators uh, here and everywhere else. So so that's awesome. Well, I think we're ready to get started. My, my clock just clicked four o'clock. Uh, and I want to honor your time and Trevor's time here as he's taking the time out of his busy schedule. I know uh, he's just as busy as the rest of us. Uh, and so Trevor, with that, uh, welcome. Welcome to Reimagine Washington Ed and Shifting Schools. Uh, and here in the state of Washington, uh, we appreciate you taking time to talk through this idea of inquiry instruction with us. Uh, as we are you know, in this remote slash, some of us are in hybrid AB schedules slash, you know how it is. Uh, so really excited to just hear your thoughts on this and, and where we go from here. So Trevor, thank you. Over to you, my friend. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Trisha. And thanks for monitoring that chat and the, uh, and the Q and A. Uh, absolutely towards the end, my friends, we'll have some time and space to, to look at that. So please uh, fully engage in the chat for us and the Q and A. And thank you for hosting me. Uh, yeah, Trevor, hi. So I wear multiple hats and I'll share some of those hats with you uh, here today so we can get to know each other bad, better. Uh, you know, one hat I wear is a, a, a teacher of inquiry. I, I teach high school here in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. So just a little north from uh, Washington State, of course. And I teach seniors, kind of junior seniors, uh, English through an inquiry model, through an inquiry stance at a fantastic public school here called Oak Bay High School. And then I wear another hat and that is as uh, teacher of teachers. I am so blessed and so fortunate to travel the world. And I say that with a big smile on my face because it's different now, but I'll speak to that throughout our time together as well. And, and I'm able to teach teachers how to implement inquiry-based learning with their kiddos and with their students in the K to 12 setting. So although I'm a high school practitioner, I visit schools around the world from pre-K, kindies, you know, the littles as I like to call them, all the way up to the bigs that I left today. You know, it's 4 p.m. here Pacific time, 
and I taught a nine till three and, and came home and welcome to my home. Yeah, I'm doing this good work from my office. And, and that's part of our pivot, you know, back in March, as we all experienced with this global pandemic, uh, you know, our school shut down right away. And come June, we kind of tried to go back to school somewhat and, and our schools let out for the summer at the end of June. So that was really happenstance and, 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 and uh, patched together, if you will, it was quite temporary. And now we're back and I'm so fortunate here in British Columbia that our numbers are quite low and that we can go back to a, a relatively normal face-to-face -face experience. So, um, you know, I have two classes a day. I have a morning class and an afternoon class, two and a half hours roughly each. And I see my kiddos for a quarter for 10 weeks and then the course is done. So everything that we used to do in a year, uh, we're looking at it through a 10 week uh, time together. And, uh, and definitely I've adopted the, the, the less is more, looking at my curriculum, looking at what, he, what is essential and trying to marry that in a process of inquiry where my students' interests and their questions and their curiosities guide us through this curriculum. So it's a fascinating reality, you know, teaching and then coming here virtually and to support you. Many of my schools, uh, we work together on a three-year basis and I'm just so lucky to be able to do this work virtually. Uh, you know, typically I would be jumping on planes, taking some time away from work, you know, definitely doing a lot over spring break and summer break with some of those long term <laughs> partnerships. And uh, to be honest, tomorrow afternoon at 5 p.m., just over dinner for an hour and a half, I'm getting online with one of my partner schools in Korea. Um, I have a standing partnership with one of my schools in Holland, and that's at 6 a.m. in the morning for me every Wednesday. So we can figure it out is what I'm saying. And uh, I want to share some of that work with you today, both with the hat of inquiry teacher, but also in the hat of, you know, teaching teachers the inquiry process. And this really is the beginning of an ongoing conversation. Inquiry isn't, uh, you know, the, the, the current trend. It's not uh, something that we're easily going to implement in, in day one. Uh, this is partly it's a mindset shift. Um, definitely, it's a shift in the role of the teacher in the room and the students in the room. And how can we do these little shifts, these little changes to have big changes happen? And so uh, I'd like to introduce you to some of that today. I'd like to invite you to be reflective of your teaching practice and uh, kind of take what I propose and put it in three bins. You know, one bin could be, I do that. That sounds like me, that's cool. He's speaking my language. Another bin could be, oh my God, no. Like what he's saying right now is so foreign and that's not for me. And then the third bin could be, hey, that's interesting. Like, I'm gonna consider that more deeply in the future and maybe that's something I take with me and, and I scratch at that a little bit more. And so everything that I share as an invitation to reflection, consider those three bins. The yeah, that's me. No, that's not me at all. And that may be bin. How can I scratch at that a bit further? I'd like to share my screen with you now. Um, I, of course, my, my face will be up in the corner. Uh, I'll be walking you through some slides and, and asking you to reflect, asking you to get in the chat and, and connect and collaborate and share your thinking. Um, and we will have these slides up on the website so that everyone can see them. So I just wanna make sure, Jeff, can you give me a thumbs up? Do you see that okay? Fantastic, thanks, Jeff. So uh, friends, this is where you can find me. I threw this information in the chat earlier. Um, there you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, and I invite you to be a part of that community. You know, on, on Twitter, I have roughly 18,000 followers there, teachers that I've worked with around the world, um, Instagram, roughly 7,000. And that's a lot of teachers that I want you to meet, that I want you to connect with. And, and any question you have about inquiry-based learning that I can't answer, they'll help us answer. You know, I often encourage teachers to tag me in a tweet if it's a question or a need for a resource or I hope for a collaboration and I simply retweet you. And then within moments, we have many teachers responding. So I invite you to be a part of that community. If inquiry-based learning is your thing and you're looking to connect with teachers outside your school, find me there and, and I'll connect you with that community. And I also use those spaces as resource spaces. And I'll show you how I share free resources in those two spaces throughout our time together. Uh, there's my website, trevormckenzie.com, full of podcasts, full of webinars that I've done, full of all the sketch notes I'm gonna share. And then of course, at the very bottom there, there is our hashtag inquiry mindset, which is that ongoing conversation, sharing of resources, and just really trying to um, be a connector of all the schools I work with around the world. I want you all to connect and learn from one another. So it's just not me 
and you, but it's there's an us, there's a community, and uh, I'd love to have you be a part of that. There are my two publications. Uh, Dive was written first. You know, Dive didn't really have a specific audience in mind other than K to 12 educator, nice and broad. Whereas Inquiry Mindset was really written for the, the primary, the elementary school educator. So if you're a middle school, high school teacher, you know, I think Dive into Inquiry is your book. And if you're an elementary school educator, Inquiry Mindset's your book. You can find those on Amazon. But you know what we'll do is we'll do a little giveaway at the end. I'm going to throw up a bit.ly uh, to sign up for my newsletter. And maybe tomorrow morning, I'll go to that bit.ly. I'll go to that sheet and I'll pick maybe five or 10 winners that have signed up uh, today, you know, from this session, maybe Jeff, you and I can maybe talk about that timeline and see where we can get a lot of traction to make sure we have a lot of people looking at that, that bit.ly. Uh, but I'd love to send these out uh, soon and you can find them on Amazon again, high school, middle school, high school, look at dive, elementary school educators look at mindset. So I'd like to introduce you first uh, just to, to some of the research around inquiry. And, and it is fascinating research. And that sounds like an oxymoron. I don't just say that because I'm an inquiry nerd. It really is fascinating research because the research actually tells us two stories that are quite opposite, but both stories are entirely true. And that's why it's fascinating. On, on one side of the research, and this research is decades old, friends. This is not anything new. It's, it's quite a school of thought. Um, you know, that the authors and the researchers that have been a part of this school of thinking, it, it's, it, it's decades old. And, and so in looking at that body of research, one part of the research, the story tells us that inquiry can increase student achievement, like grades and test scores and all those assessments improve through the inquiry model. It tells us that students report out feeling fulfilled and that their schooling is meaningful and that they feel confident in learning and that they have some control over learning that they like. So one side of the research tells that story. And then the other side of the research, which is also true, but it's the opposite, tells us the opposite. It tells us that achievement actually de declines, decreases in the inquiry process, that students not only report that they don't feel confident or a sense of control over learning, but specifically they feel overwhelmed and anxious in learning. And it's, it's so interesting that the research, both ends of that, that story are completely accurate. And I'll tell you why. And, and it's because of some of these barriers that I've researched throughout my career uh, that let us know what the, what the challenges are to implementing inquiry-based learning. I'm going to introduce these, these challenges, these barriers to you today, because I'd like you to keep these three in mind as you think of your teaching, as you think of your school. And, and so you can remove these barriers as well as you can. You know, if you're interested in bringing inquiry to your kiddos and to your staff, you need to be aware of these three challenges. And the first one has to do with that, that story that I was referring to. You know, the schools that I work with that have a common language around inquiry-based learning, meaning I can go in from classroom to classroom to classroom, and the teachers are all speaking using the same language. You know, kiddos are hearing the same words when we're talking about teaching and learning. Principals and administrators, when they stand up in front of parents or when they stand up at a staff meeting, they're using the same language. So there's no confusion because what happens, those two stories that I was referring to, on one side of the spectrum, we're talking about really strongly scaffolded inquiry where we engage in different types of inquiry which lead to increasing student agency. And in that increasing student agency, students are acquiring certain skills and competencies that allow them to be successful in inquiry. Whereas the other side is free inquiry, which is what we call kicking the kids into the deep end without those skills and without those competencies. And so that's how we can see those two sides of the research totally be accurate, is one is scaffolded, that's the successful kind, and one isn't scaffolded, and that's the kind that we kick our kids into the deep end of free inquiry. So in order to make sure that we are on the right side of that story, we need to have that common language. Uh, I'm gonna introduce you to some of that language today. I'm gonna to ask you to think currently right now, how's your language in inquiry? When I talk about inquiry internally, is there, are there a few words that come up in your head? You know, is there a process that you follow? If I asked you to write down some inquiry jargon, what would it be? And uh, that would kind of let us know where you're at in terms of this specific challenge. The second challenge that the research tells us uh, that is a barrier to implementing inquiry-based learning in the K-12 setting has to do with resources. You know, the schools that I visit that are well-stocked with books, 
you know, they have a PD library where they can go and they could find my books, they're behind me. But, but any inquiry books, as I mentioned, it's a rich school of thinking. And those, those libraries, those PD spaces in schools where teachers can go and sign out Ron Richards Making Thinking Visible, for example, or Guy Claxon's Learning Power series, all of those books at the ready for teachers, those schools are more successfully implementing inquiry-based learning. But resources go beyond just merely books. You know, time is probably the most significantly powerful resource I see in schools that I work with. And what I mean by time is that teachers have some embedded time in their weeks to connect and collaborate with each other away from students, you know, so we can bounce ideas off one another. So we can look at our unit design and look at the process of inquiry and support one another. And, and that time resource is huge. You know, this webinar is a resource, digital resources, podcasts, webinars, getting on Twitter and actively engaging in those communities that I referenced earlier. The schools where staff are embedded in those three layers of resources from books, to, uh, to the time and then to the digital resources, that, that essentially allows me to see that they are further along in successfully Im implementing inquiry-based learning. So I want you to think of your specific school context again, your teaching, where are you in that resource exploration? You know, do you have these things at the ready? Are you engaged in those resources or is this more of a significant barrier than we perhaps first perceived? The third barrier has to do with student agency and students as inquirers. And I just wanna take a moment to define student agency. Um, student agency is, is, is quite on the tip of the tongue of the educational discourse today. You know, you see it on Twitter all the time. You see it on, you know, Edutopia or Mindshift. People are writing about it. And, and sadly, I think in some pockets, we're getting student agency wrong. Student agency isn't merely giving students choice over assignments. Like, Here's your agency, Jeff. You could do uh, an essay, you could do uh, a presentation, an oral presentation, you could do a slide deck, or you can do a poster project. That's your agency, kiddos. You know, that's merely choice, and, and that's merely a menu. Student agency is actively engaging your kiddos in the process of learning from start to finish, so they are doing some of that heavy lifting. You know, like we spend all the time designing the unit. Let's design some of the unit with our kiddos. Let's get them actively engaged in the research phase where rather than we're coming in with all the books and resources that we're going to engage student learning with, let's get them actively involved in that decision-making. Definitely let's ask them, hey, if you could show me what you know in any way, how do you wanna show me what you know? That's that summative piece that let's give them some choice, but we need to be embedding student voice throughout the learning process. Essentially what we're saying is we are co-designing learning with our kiddos. So now that we know what student agency is, let's transition to teacher agency. If we want student agency, we need to have some teacher agency. The schools that I worked with were teachers or inquirers themselves. They're asking big questions of themselves. They're researching how they can implement inquiry, but also how they could become more effective teachers, more effective inquiry practitioners. Undeniably, if we have teacher as inquirer, we're going to have student as inquirer, and then we have a culture of inquiry. And what I mean by that is if teachers are inquirers, they're coaching and modeling their thinking for their students, their curiosities for their students. It's, it's like they're living and breathing the existence they want for their kiddos. And it turns out that it's not just an assignment or a project. It's we're an inquiry school because that's, you know, when we walk into this building, that's, that's how we think. That's how we speak. That's how we question. So this third one's imperative. You know, if we want inquiry for our kiddos, we actually need to be inquirers ourselves. And that creates a culture of inquiry. The schools that I work with, as I referenced earlier, these aren't fast changes. These aren't, you know, let's drop these ingredients in a pan and fry them up. And by the end of the hour, you know, we're ready. This takes time. And part of that is the mind shift time. Part of this is, you know, that collaborative time. Let's come together and, and work together. And a lot of these changes happen gradually across several years. So I'd like you to consider throughout the rest of this time together, you know, what is one thing that you're going to take as a baby step towards bringing more inquiry to your practice? What's just one takeaway that you're going to put in that third pail, that third bucket, and you're going to consider doing that, implementing that, and thinking about that with some more intentionality in the coming days, not months, in the coming days. What is one thing you're going to take away today 
that could set you on this course of a three-year journey where you're bringing more authentic inquiry to your practice. So that being said, just a little reflection in the chat. I think it'd be nice to have this go in the chat is of these three barriers, which are kind of green lights for you, which are non-issues, which is like something that you feel like, ah, that's, that's not keeping me back from doing inquiry-based learning at my school, which is a yellow, which is like, yeah, that's a barrier, you know, with a, with a little bit of work, maybe we can remove that. And then which, which is a red, which is a significant barrier that is going to require some time and some planning and some thinking in order to remove that barrier. And if you could just maybe throw one of those three, you know, whether it's a green light or a yellow light or a red light in the chat. Um, and I'll, I'll pitch it over to Jeff just momentarily as people are jumping in the chat. And, and Jeff, I'm curious as to your experience, what stands out to you, you know, in terms of a red light, a yellow light or a green light? Is there something that stands out to you as being a significant barrier, a somewhat barrier in your practice or a green barrier or not a barrier, I should say? Yeah. And I, I, I love that. Um, you know, using a stop like activity like this. Um, I think the consistent language is something. And even we, we uh, Trisha and I, again, have been doing uh, trainings all day. And we've been talking about this idea of being consistent, uh, being consistent, not just in my classroom, but as a community. Are we consistent across grade levels? Are we consistent across school culture? Uh, what does that, what does that look like for us? Uh, so I see that as, as something that we're, we're working towards. I think that's a yellow light right now. I think we're finding that as something that we're working for. Um, I find a green light and I, I'll just, not every school, but I think, you know, readily accessible and well-utilized resources. I, most schools here in, here in the state of Washington have pretty well stacked uh, professional development libraries. Uh, the idea now that we know every teacher has a computer. So those digital resources you know, if you can find them, if you know how to find them, they're out there yeah. um, to be able to do that. The time piece, of course, is always something, you know, the time to actually do that. And then that third one is, I think I, I love this idea. And I think this, to me, that's the one where, you know, our, especially the teacher as inquire, and even Trisha wrote, you know, how often do learners see school leaders and teachers being curious? Mm -hmm. You know, where do we see that? Where do we show that mm -hmm. uh, as, as you know, lead inquirers in our schools. Where where is that? And that that's one that I find is is kind of a yellowish red. Yeah, I think yeah. sometimes. Thanks, and Jeff. I think uh, yeah. you know, Sorry, been, Trisha, go for it. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, that that issue. I think when you're in person is a little bit easier. You know, I've worked at schools where, uh, as a staff, we decided on the outside of our door we were all going to have a consistent sign talking about what am I curious about right now? Like, what's kind of an outside of academia hobby that I have? And students really responded to it. And what we also did as teachers is we listed here's two or three questions to ask me about what I'm learning. And that sparked some great conversations. So I know in a remote learning context, figuring out how to kind of leave those breadcrumbs, you know, that I think that's okay. We've got to, we have to pivot and think of new ways to do that. Uh, you know, one, Jeff, sorry, this is like the fifth time you've heard me talk about this today is I think virtual backgrounds are, are a good way. Like, you know, the one that I use here, I always mix it up and I leave a different book that I'm reading. So again, if you're a language arts person, I think like, it's, you know, is it like you do that and then you're done? No, of course not. But I do think it's kind of a, a nice little way to say, hey, I'm a learner too. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Thank you both for sharing it. And going back to something that Jeff had, had said about that common language, you know, I, I really ask schools I work with to be like really critical about the language they use, right? Like one, one thing I see in a lot of schools that I visit is, you know, we, we value growth mindset. Like growth mindset is something we stand by. We want that to be instilled in all of our kiddos. And I lean into that one. I say, well, what do you mean by that? And what does that look like? Like, give me some synonyms for that so I can look for that when I go observe your staff teach. So when I'm going and watching your kiddos and learning, what should I be seeing? And then we really start to not only pick apart the language, but pick apart the behavior, right? Then we can get into, well, let's look at our assessment practice. Is our assessment practice a one and done? Like the kiddo handed it in, that's your mark and, and, and the learning is done? Or is there opportunity to demonstrate growth mindset through our assessment practice? And our kiddos need more than growth mindset. Like the more words we have that are really intentional. You know, I love, I love talking about buoyancy. I want buoyant learners. I want learners that can take a hit and bounce back up, right? Like get crashed by a wave and bounce back up. And I, I say that to him. And that's the other piece, Trisha, is let's draw the curtain back 
aren't our intentions for our kiddos and let them know that. Like I, I use these words with my students day in and day out. There's no, you know, Wizard of Oz where Mr. McKenzie is behind the curtain planning and orchestrating everything. No, no, no. I pull the curtain back and I say, the reason we're doing things right now the way we're doing them is because I'm hoping this intention comes out. The reason I'm giving you feedback right now on this learning is because I'm hoping you are becoming stronger in terms of resiliency and buoyancy and growth mindset. So I'm constantly making the connections with my kiddos. And again, it comes back to the importance of language as Jeff, Jeff had referred to, like language is critical and we need to map that out. We need to hash it out. And then we need to draw the curtain back as to why that's so important. We're going to transition a bit here, friends, and I'm not in the chat right now, but please, as, as we're going through the rest of the time together, I want you to consider how maybe these red light and yellow light specific reflections may change for you just with the introduction of a few resources and some of the conversations we're about to have. You know, definitely that language piece, if you consider that to be a red or a yellow, and I begin to introduce you to some language, or at the very least, introduce you to some resources that you can revisit, I wonder if that shifts for you. Also, I, I love the green light, yellow light, red light. Like it's hanging in my classroom. And I, I ask students to consider getting in the yellow zone of learning often. Like, you know, how is your learning right now? Is it red, red zone, yellow zone, or, 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 or green zone? And if they're in the green zone, that's too easy. Like I wanna stretch them a little bit more. If they're too in the red, that, that's a little bit too challenging. I don't know unless I ask them. And so that symbol hangs in the corner of my room. I'm actually on the lookout for a real traffic light that actually will light up. Uh, but you know, that's something that we've cut out and I refer to it often. And so if you were to visit my class, you would see that symbol as a reflection tool to kind of guide where we're at now and where we need to go to next, like moment to moment in learning. So I encourage you to adopt some of how we're talking about inquiry to bring it to your classroom. Uh, I love this sketch note, uh, you know, a, a hallmark of my work in implementing inquiry with kiddos and with teachers is through the power of imagery. Um, I've got an amazing co-author that has produced mostly all of our sketch notes, but this one is from Sylvia Duckworth. And uh, Sylvia Duckworth is a retired French immersion teacher from Toronto, Canada. She is a prolific sketch noter. If you Google image search Sylvia Duckworth, you'll see her body of work. It is fantastic. And Sylvia and I collaborated on this one about five, six years ago. And I asked Sylvia to help me document in a sketch note all of the things I see when I visit teachers teach. So one way I support schools is I visit the, the teachers actually in their classroom. They invite me in, they give me an inquiry lesson and they say, give me some feedback. And, and after the session, after I've observed them and taken notes and gotten into the learning with the kiddos and the teacher, you know, we have a good chat about how things went. And over the course of years, these are the things I see surface in those classrooms that I visit. Now, it should be said that all 10 of these don't surface in a single lesson. That, that would be impossible. These surface across several lessons. So, you know, if I were to visit Trisha teach, uh, you know, a grade eight class, I would see all of these surface maybe across a week or maybe across five lessons. I should see all of this occur across time. And sometimes a different characteristic kind of bubbles up more than another, right? Like sometimes you can really, really feel the, the, the increase in motivation and engagement whereas maybe the research phase isn't as prevalent at that moment. So this is a really nice space for teachers to reflect on, well, what's going on in my practice right now? Like before Trevor even proposes anything else, now that I see this language of these 10, what are a part of my inquiry repertoire? You know, imagine this, if I were to visit you teach at your school for a week, like if you can handle me for a week, if I were to observe you teach for a week, what would I see in that week? And I'd like you to consider even doing a little diagnostic. Like I've got my notebook right beside me here. I've got my pen. If you have something similar, please use it. And write down one through 10, what, which are a part of your current repertoire? And you know, if I were to do this activity at a school with an entire staff, let's, let's imagine like pre-COVID, we have 80 teachers in a gym and I'm walking you through this sketch note. I would ask every teacher to write down on a sticky note a number that represents one of these characteristics. And then we would post all those sketch or all those sticky notes on one wall, as many as each of you represent. So what we have on one wall is kind of a diagnostic, like one through 10, what do we do as a staff here that is aligned with this language? And me in the room, I'm looking for any holes in, in those columns of sticky notes, right? Like let's say we have a whole bunch of ones 
and a whole bunch of twos and threes, but we've got like no sixes. Well, that tells me that I have certain things I need to do to support that school and more authentically embedding inquiry across the school. And so I encourage you to think of that, you know, what is your diagnostic one through 10? And then what are the things that are maybe lacking in that one through 10? Maybe there are some holes there. If we're talking about building capacity, let's reflect on these characteristics and consider what you do well, what's a part of your game right now, and what you can add to your inquiry teaching. You know, if you were to observe me teach at Oak Bay High School, undeniably you would see number eight, fortifying the importance of asking good questions. The evidence of number eight in my teaching practice, it's the question formulation technique. If you're unfamiliar with the question formulation technique, it's from a book called Make Just One Change by Dan Rothstein and Lou Santana. This would be one of those books that should be a part of your PD library if inquiry is for you. Um, and essentially the question formulation technique, QFT for short, it's a questioning framework, a protocol that teachers can use in their classroom to have their students become more competent questioners. So they understand the difference between closed-ended questions and open-ended questions so they can write the ungoogleable question, right? Isn't that what we want for kiddos is to research things that are hard and, and that they have to triangulate their resources. And so we aim for that ungoogleable question. And so the QFT is how I make sure number eight happens. That's the evidence of number eight. You know, again, if I was at a school in a gymnasium with 80 teachers or 100 teachers, I would ask them to come together in a table at their, at their tables, excuse me, and share, well, which of these characteristics are a part of your repertoire? And what is the evidence of each of these characteristics? Like I said, the QFT. And then I would ask you to listen for evidence that you want to bring back to your classroom. So maybe you weren't aware of the QFT before I referenced it. That would be something that, you know, that goes into that third pail. Oh, I want to learn more about that. I want to bring that to my teacher, my teaching. I, I'm, I'm kind of describing it as that activity because I think you could bring this activity back to your staff. You could have this conversation with them virtually. You can have this conversation with them at social distance within, you know, your school context to build capacity so you're not the only one on this inquiry journey your whole staff is a part of this conversation. You know, again, if, if there are areas in this sketch note that you feel uh, aren't a part of your repertoire yet, I would encourage you to make that your goal. Like which of these would be something you'd like to do more of in the coming days and weeks and months ahead? And that you're gonna do some research around, you're gonna do some planning around in your unit design. And then in implementation, you're gonna to try to be intentional with having that surface in your classroom and then when you exit the classroom, you're going to reflect on how that went. And wouldn't it be great if you shared that with a colleague? Like if you and your colleague each chose a goal and you kind of kept each other honest, you asked each other how it's going, provided some feedback and advice and support. Um, if you'd like to folks in the chat, you know, maybe do just that. Of all these 10, what would be one that would be your personalized inquiry goal moving forward? What would be one that you'd like to bring some more intentionality to in your planning, in your implementation, and in your reflection. And as you're doing that, I'll call on Jeff and Tricia again to maybe ch share one that they feel would be aligned with a goal that they could set for themselves in their work. Uh, Tricia, how about you go first? I'll put you on the spot since Jeff went first last time. As people are in the chat, what would be one goal you could set for yourself? You know, I, I'm really partial to goal number four, and I, I don't know, should I be picking a goal that, uh, you know, that appeals to me or not, but I, I, I just think that idea of fostering curiosity and a love for learning, I think if we're able to do that, it directly affects numbers three and two. Um, and I just, I think it's such an instrumental goal in really bolstering that classroom community and that classroom culture. And I, I think, you know, curiosity is contagious. So the more we're able to foster that, I feel like that sparks it for students as well when they're able to see that. So that, that's really the one that kind of jumps out at me because I, my sense is that I feel like that one is going to influence um, a few of the others. And, and Trevor, you know, I love that idea of sharing a goal with a colleague. And now I'm also thinking, why not share this goal with my students, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They're going to be the ones to give me some great feedback on this as well. Um, you know, and I kind of think that idea of a love for learning, what's more authentic than me saying, you know, this is something I'm working on. I, I, I always want to improve. 
yeah, for, I love for, that. for my learners. I love that. You know, one thing you said was you thought if number four happens, three and two could happen. And absolutely, friends that are watching, consider which of these could be your first domino, where if you hit that goal, others will happen. And then you, you reference, you know, that that support, that mentorship, that, you know, keeping each other honest and collaborating with a colleague, that is that culture of inquiry. That's why I was really leaning into, hey, let's make that goal visible and connect with someone. And that's going to help create that culture of inquiry, that culture of learning for our colleagues, as well as for our kiddos. And, you know, I just set a, a goal with my kiddos this year. We, we have a bunch of competencies in our room that my students have identified they want to work towards. And one of the competencies they've identified is the competency of self-control. And so I've set that as my goal. And so all my grade 12s, if you can imagine, they've uh, printed off a little bitmoji, we've laminated them and they posted their bitmoji on the competency that they are going to track as their personal learning goal for the quarter. And I chose self-control because I, I gotta be honest, Trisha, all the noise of our profession, all the things we have to do, all the things, all the assessments, all the standardization, I find sometimes the hardest thing is to not speed things up. Like I get in the class and I look at my watch and oh my gosh, I only have them for this amount of time. I gotta go, go, go. And so I'm really asking my students to help me slow it down, right? Like calm it right down. And if I can manage that self-control competency, I think my students will be better for it. And so I've made that visible so they can help me be honest, just as you said, like make our goals visible so that we are modeling that learning with them. And, and that way, when I want to coach it and model it with my kids, it's an honest reflection, right? Uh, Jeff, how about you? What would be one that uh, could be your personal learning goal moving forward from this sketch? Uh, I think my personal goal is number 10, right? Like solving problems for tomorrow in the classrooms of today. Um, and just, you know, as you work backwards from that, what are all those pieces that need to happen? And, I, and for me, we just live in a time period where we have access to things that allow us to do that. I mean, like truly yeah. help to solve the problems. Uh, one of the things, like one of my favorite things that I did when I was working with a high school teacher here a couple of years ago is kids were really upset. We had a salmon stream and the kids in science class went out and found that the Simon, you know, the salmon stream was polluted and they were all like, well, what can we do about it? And it was like, well, you could email the representatives of the state because you know, every representative has an email address. Like we, they're, the, 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 everything's just sitting here. And so it's like, how do you get kids involved to be like, you mean I can do that? Yes, you can do that. Like there are ways to reach out to people, to bring in those, if, you, if you're trying to find something, you know, of how do we solve this problem? There are so many ways to reach out. And one of the things we've been talking about throughout the Reimagine program is this ability that for better or for worse right now, everybody knows Zoom. So yeah. you, like everybody in the world, not just like us, but like everybody in the world knows Zoom and everybody's, you know, knows how to log in and get here. And so who are you inviting into your classroom to help kids understand what are the problems of tomorrow and how do we start solving those today? Yeah, I love that. And, you know, oftentimes teachers feel a little overwhelmed with number 10, you know, because the, it, it, it kind of drives home this notion that these problems are massive and these problems are too big for kiddos and these problems are, you know, they're the problems of tomorrow for a reason. We don't necessarily know them yet. And, and I really encourage teachers to look at number 10 through the lens of authenticity, like keep it real. And Jeff, you referenced that, that story of the salmon, like that local stream, like that is a local authentic context, like keep it real, look local and make sure it's authentic. Anything in your curriculum, whether it's a math concept or a historical event in history class, social studies, look at it through the lens of your context, like make it authentic have it be connected to something that is tangible for the kiddos, whatever the math concept is, where do we see it in the world around us? And it's not this nuanced, like, you know, weird nebulous connection. It's no, no, no. That concept is right there. And that authenticity is going to drive home things like the curiosity factor, the motivation and engagement factor. It's going to empower student voice because as, as they connect to those stakeholders, like you referenced, Jeff, that is them driving the, the learning car, so to speak. So I encourage teachers to think of number 10, uh, also in the vein of just keep it real. What's the local authentic context? And then maybe we can go you know, more nationwide or globally. Uh, you know, Sustainability is a massive concept, isn't it? It can be quite overwhelming when you look at the global challenges around sustainability. How can we look at it through the local context? So that big idea comes to life through something really 
real for our kiddos. So uh, all of these sketch notes, go ahead, Jeff, you want to say something? Uh, I was just gonna say uh, in the chat, number nine seems one that a lot of teachers are, are really grabbing onto. Can you maybe talk about that a little bit, this idea of enabling students to take ownership? What, yeah, what do you see yeah. around that? Yeah, so that's a great question. You know, an, an underpinning of the inquiry classroom is we're partners with our students. We, we are co-designers and co-constructors of many things. And so to hit number nine out of the park, I encourage you to co-design something with your students. And you could co-design many things, but what we're doing is we're including their voice with something we know we wanna to get to and we're coming to that place together. So you can co-design class expectations. Obviously many teachers do this, don't we? You know, what does a great learning environment look like kiddos? I want you to get into groups of three and spill out all your thoughts, either in a breakout room or face-to-face -face on a piece of paper. And tell me what does a really good learning room look like and and the things that they miss because we know there are some things that have to happen to have good learning happen in a class the things that don't come up from their conversations i suggest or i add in and so eventually what we do is we get to one master doc that is a co-design list of, of how we operate in a classroom you know that that's a pretty simple example you know i love to co-design my my assessment tools my rubrics especially the rubrics that are mandated from my gov government agency, right? Like we all have standardized assessments we have to give our kids. I'm thinking of, you know, a, an essay rubric, for example, as an English teacher. I never just come in and hand that rubric over to my kids and say, this is how I'm going to grade you kiddos. I always bring in that rubric and I put it on my desk and I walk them through a co-design activity. I say, what does a great essay have in it? Again, get into those groups of three and spill out all your ideas that a good essay should have. And maybe even I write some language on the board that I'm hoping they use in their conversation. Things like thesis statement or word choice or tone or you know citations or quotation use, et cetera, because I wanna make sure that their language is actually accurate. It's getting them to the rubric that I have on my desk, but they're getting it, they're getting to that rubric by me sharing what they already know, their prior knowledge. You know, again, I, I walk through the room and I listen for things. Ron Richard likes to say vigorously listen, like lean into it and make connections across the room. You can hold up a conversation and say, hey, kiddos, I'm seeing Jeff and Trish over here in their group. They're talking about word choice. D does anybody else have word choice? Does it sound like something you should add to yours too? Or over there, I heard thesis statement. I heard that over here too. Should that go on all of ours? So slowly what we're doing is we're guiding the ship to get to the exact same rubric I have on my desk, but it's through the lens of student voice. It's through the lens of me assessing what they already know, assessing their prior knowledge and giving them the language that they don't have yet. When I've co-designed assessment tools with my kiddos, undeniably, I see achievement increase because kids have a clear understanding of the assessment tool. It's a beautiful thing when we begin to co-design with our students, they begin to have uh, not just confidence in their ownership over learning, but success in that ownership over learning. Co-designing could be many things. Uh, you know, another thing I ask is, you know, if you could show me your learning in any way, how would you like to show me what you know? Let's co-design a, a summative assessment. And some students will want to assess or create a video. Some will want to do an essay. I give them that choice, but it's not just a menu. It's through the, the lens of co-designing everything uh, with my kiddos. So again, that number nine, it, it is an underpinning of the inquiry stance, co-designing and somewhat decentering ourselves. Did you hear that I said, I get them into groups of three a lot? You know, yes, I have my kids in rows sometimes, but when I wanna co-design, when I want them to collaborate, they turn and face into groups of threes and I decenter myself from the front of the room and I get into the periphery or I get amongst them and I listen and they're the center of the learning now. And that's that shifting of roles that the inquiry process really proposes we take on. How do we share the learning with our kids through some co-design and co-constructing frameworks? Um, Jeff, any questions about that one? I threw a lot at you there. Thumbs up, great. So we're gonna transition friends to the next slide and we're rolling right along. Again, you can find all these sketch notes for free on my website, trevormckenzie.com. Uh, I do suggest if this is up your alley, you print these off and you hang them in your class. You know, this is something that I point to often. And in my classrooms, we start the year in structured inquiry and we slowly transition through these different types. 
so that by the end of the year, we finish off in free inquiry. And that's that space where we don't want to kick our kids into the deep end, as I referred to. We want to scaffold through the year so that slowly they're nurturing those competencies that are going to allow them to be successful with that agency over learning. Competencies are important in inquiry, as they should be in any classroom now. And, you know, 21st century learning skills, you know, collaboration, communication, creativity, uh, critical thinking. The competencies that I just mentioned allow students to get ready for these different types of inquiry. You know, teachers who are new to inquiry, students who are new to inquiry, I, I always suggest we start in the shallow end. You know, let's get into the swimming pool of inquiry where all students are exploring one question that I've designed, an overarching, ungoogleable question. Um, I've selected all the resources, and so I can kind of coach them and model how I got those resources and why I chose those resources, where I found them. And then all of my students in that structured inquiry side are doing the same summative assessment. And so some of the summative assessments that I structure in at that shallow end are the ones I have to do, are the ones that are in my curriculum, or the ones that I know are later on in the year they're going to get tested on. So this isn't, um, inquiry isn't an either or. You know, we can't do our curriculum and not do inquiry, or we're doing inquiry but not our curriculum. We need to weave those together, and it's going to be through this scaffolding where we slowly begin to kind of reimagine our curriculum through the lens of these four types. You know, I challenge you to consider looking at your curriculum. Where in your curriculum do you feel like there could be more student agency, more of the guided or free side in your curriculum? And where in your curriculum is there less agility, less space to maneuver? So you want to maybe have those curricular standards be presented in a structured inquiry or controlled inquiry framework. You know, this is a, a unit planning uh, kind of framework, isn't it? You know, Looking at your unit design, I would say, well, what, what, which of your units that you're planning to roll out fall under these four categories? You know, teachers who are new to this, I often ask them to reflect in inquiry experiences in the past, where have you been in the pool and how did it go? And I often hear from teachers, oh, I went to the deep end because I thought the deep end would be best for kids. And it was a bit of a mess. It was a hot mess express. Kids were overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed. And now you can see why, right? If we start in structured and we transition and we're focusing on those competencies so our students can be successful with that agency, uh, it's not gonna be a hot mess. There's gonna be that genuine ownership and confidence over learning. So again, friends, I'm not gonna ask you to jump into the chat here with this one, but I do want you to consider these four types. Where have you had experience and, and how did it go? And now seeing these four types, uh, what would you do differently? And these four types are the scaffolding that lead to that positive side of the research narrative that I was sharing earlier. If we want achievement to increase, students to feel confident and successful with that control over learning, we have to go through this scaffolding to get it. If we just kick our kids into the deep end, the other side of the narrative happens where achievement decreases and they feel overwhelmed and anxious. Uh, Jeff, I'll, I'll pitch it to you briefly before we transition. Anything strike you uh, from this sketch note? That's a broad question, but I just wanted to see your thoughts currently. Yeah, no, I, I love the layout of this and really thinking through like what is best for me. And I was just sharing in the chat um, as, a, as a fourth grade teacher, I have failed big time jumping into the free inquiry and without having that scaffolding in place, you know, where you're actually helping kids get to the deep end where you think you can just say, Hey, choose your topic around X, Y, and Z and go. And, you know, and the, this whole idea, especially, you know, that was really the way I was taught to teach in the late nineties, uh, when I came out of, you know, um, when I came out of college. And, and to, to really take a step back and look at the structures that are in place. And what we talk about a lot here in Reimagine is this idea of being highly structured, loosely organized. And really what you're talking about is the structure that needs to be in place. And it, you are, it's a, it's a gradual release of responsibility, mm -hmm. but the structure, even in free inquiry, the structure is still important. You've got to have a structure around the way that you tackle a problem, tackle a question, tackle a project. There, there, are, there are these systems that we, that we do every day just in life that we can bring into this. But the structure, no matter where you are on the spectrum, the structure is, to me, in my mind, the most important part, however yeah. you set that up. No, you're absolutely right. You know, in, in my first book, Dive in Inquiry, I write about the free inquiry proposal. And, and in Canada, we have this amazing TV show. It's called Dragon's Den. 
And as you guys do down there, you steal all of our best shows and you come up with a better American version. And so your version is Shark Tank, right? And and it's when that, you know, budding entrepreneur comes on and and the entrepreneur pitches to the the, the, the successful business people their model. They want investment. And so, you know, I've taken that and, and my students do a free inquiry pitch where we sit down one-on-one -on -one and they have six steps that they're going to speak to. And, and if they speak eloquently enough and, and uh, broadly enough to all of those organizational pieces of that structure that you're referring to, Jeff, they get a thumbs up. If they have some things they need to tweak, they get that feedback and then they go back and they make those revisions. And that's what that successful agency free inquiry experience is going to look like is, do they have their ducks in a row? Are they following that structure so that with that agency, we can still ensure that they're going to have a successful outcome and so that they don't feel overwhelmed. And of course, to get them ready for that agency free inquiry, we've nurtured those competencies. Like I referenced collaboration, right? You, you can't be successful in free inquiry without being a strong collaborator. Communication, critical thinking, creativity, all of these competencies come to the forefront of the free inquiry uh, end of the pool. And we structure those and we teach to those and we nurture those throughout the other sides of the pool. So when we get there, the kiddos are going to be most successful. I'm going to transition through a few more slides and I'm not going to speak too deeply on each of these, but I want to introduce you to more of that language, more of the resources that you can find for free at trevormckenzie.com. You know, this is a neat one for just the inquiry process so that students can see that there are these benchmarks, these checkpoints where we just slow down and although, you know, the outcome may be uncertain or we may feel a little lost at the moment, we have these benchmarks, these checkpoints that we are all going to settle in on. And so, you know, you see the reflect and revise little checkpoints or signs. I'm really trying to teach my students right now how to be reflective. How do you consider where they're at, consider where they're at now and what their next steps are uh, moving forward. And so, this map, the, the, the boys love it. Like you referenced grade four, Jeff, like boys love looking at learning as an adventure. And they don't like looking at learning as being passive or complacent or inactive. Inquiry can be really engaging, especially for boys who see that, wow, I'm gonna have an active role in this process. I'm not just gonna be sitting at a desk all day. I'm gonna be moving and shaking and exploring. I'm excited for this. And we wanna paint the picture that learning is exciting and inquiry is different than being inactive and complacently sitting in your desk inquiry is going to call on you to do some heavy lifting and get going on this with me now so this map allows us to see those common checkpoints uh, and allow students to see where we're going and what our next steps could be uh, here's one that outlines that agency piece and and again i love this one because we're really trying to clarify what student agency means and how, yes, you know, that I have a genuine, uh, where is it, showing and explaining my thinking in different ways, right? Like I could, I could decide how I want to share my learning, yes. But there are all these other things, like knowing my strengths and stretches as a learner. You know, I've got some genuine decision making in this classroom. You know, my questions can shape my learning. And this one looks like it's more for the grade one, grade two, grade three classroom. I just showed this to my grade 12s two days ago. And I said, of these, which have we hit already in this classroom? You know, we've only been together for five weeks, which have already surfaced? And they love that reflection activity. I actually asked them to write about it. You know, you said we've done four of those, put pen to paper and tell me what that looks like. And then I took that in as part of my writing assessment because I am an English teacher, right? I, I have to bring in those standardized writing assessments. So again, it's not an either or, it's what are we choosing to do with the time we have with students? And is agency and inquiry a part of that conversation? I'm, I'm encouraging you to consider bringing that to your kiddos. You know, here are the four pillars of inquiry. When students get to that free inquiry, that deep end of the pool, I ask them to consider choosing an inquiry topic based on one of these four things through the lens of our curriculum. So what's something you're passionate about? What's a goal you have? What's a curiosity you have? Or what's a challenge, something new you want to learn about that perhaps you've never picked up before? Through the lens of my English curriculum or your science curriculum or your history curriculum, whatever your curriculum is, introduce it through the lens of these four pillars. So students see that, wow, I could be really curious about something in this curriculum. Like I could set a goal within this curriculum or yeah, I was really passionate when I learned about that thing three weeks ago. Maybe I can explore that more deeply 
in this free inquiry side of the pool. So again, as Jeff had mentioned, how important structures are, we know we just don't kick our kids into the deep end without some of these conversations, some of these reflective processes, and some of these structures. Um, design of the classroom, here's another one for you. I love being playful with how my classroom is designed. Uh, as a high school teacher, you know, I'd say my classroom is, is pretty unique. You know, it, it, yeah, I have rows sometimes, but my kids are always in pods. They're always turning and facing. You know, at the front of my room, I've got these big posters of competencies with, like I said earlier, bitmojis where students have set a personalized learning goal. I've got something called the curiosity jar, which is a big mason jar. And I tell kids at any time throughout our, our days together, you could write down something you're curious about and throw it in the jar. And every so often I'm gonna pull out a curiosity and I'll plan a lesson around it. And I never pull out curiosities blindly, like never, because I'm setting myself up for something wrong going on, right? But in my prep time or over lunch, I'll pull out a few and I'm trying to show them that their curiosities are part of our curriculum. So no matter what they're curious about, I'm the expert in the room. My job is to connect it to our curriculum. So that's a, a little bit of how I'm infusing student voice into the design of the space. Um, you know, this is K to 12. There are elements that are definitely more, you know, primary in here. And then there are elements that are definitely more high school in here. Uh, the virtual wonder wall uh, Padlet's one. I'm a big Flipgrid fan. I love using both platforms to document student wonderings and thinkings and questions that they have. We're going to transition. I'm going to go right through this one just for the sake of time to this prompt. So here are a whole bunch of the sketch notes that I shared with you. And, and essentially what I was trying to do was introduce you to more of this language around inquiry. And as you can see across, and this is just, you know, a portion of our sketch notes, there are probably triple the amount that you see here. I'm trying to introduce this language to you so you can reflect on that one barrier that we referred to earlier. You know, based on everything that I just shared with you, all those sketch notes, what is some of the language you have adopted into your practice? Now, maybe you see that language and you say, oh, I was familiar with that. You know, that sketch note resonated with me. That made sense to me. And then perhaps which of these sketch notes do you currently use? I know my work is down there in Washington State. You know, I, I'm not kidding myself. I know there are teachers who are watching right now who have read this, have read these books. Which of these sketch notes have you seen or do you use with your students? And then what are some areas that you can bring some of this language more intentionally into your practice? You know, if you had to choose one of those sketch notes to introduce your kiddos to tomorrow, what sketch note would you use? And in fact, Trisha, I'll ask you if you're still there with us. <laughs> what sketch note would you use if you had to introduce inquiry or bring this language to your students tomorrow? What sketch note jumps out to you right now? You know, I'm thinking about the the bottom right one and and Trevor, the reflective activity where you were asking students to pinpoint which elements they think we've been experiencing together as learners. And I'm thinking, would that be a regular ongoing activity we would use? And would that become sort of a portfolio for the year? Um, and would we talk about sort of, you know, I think it, initially maybe it's looking at identifying and understanding and then does it get deeper and are they thinking why? And why is this going to be an essential component for me as a learner, you know, when I'm outside of high school and when I'm beyond college and university? Because, I, you know, I'm thinking about a lot of these metaphors and how they're useful for us even when we are adults and we need to figure out how to learn on our own. Um, you know, I think it's important when we've decided a, a, a path that we want to take that we don't throw ourselves into the deep end. So just thinking about really framing that as sort of a lifelong practice habit or skill set. Yeah, and, and essentially that is the legacy I hope to leave behind for my kiddos are what are those enduring mindsets that they're going to leave our schools with and it's not the content. It's not what they are tested on. It's those habits of mind, those competencies that they will leave our schools with that will set them off in good stead for those future steps that you refer to. You know, that is something that I did as a co-design experience with my students this year. I said, what are those competencies you want to explore together in this class? If we agree that there are certain employable skills, if you will, that are more relevant today than they were 20 years ago, well, let's make those part of what we do in this classroom. And my kiddos identified seven. And like I said, I have them up in large icons at the front of the room. And now when we talk about inquiry or when we talk about what we're reading or when we talk about how we're researching, we're constantly connecting it to these enduring mindsets and habits that we're hoping students are sharpening. 
And again, it's a goal they've set for themselves. I haven't said you have to work on the critical thinking because you're not good at that. This is something that they have said, I want to explore that. I want to commit myself to that. I'm willing to do that. And that engagement is, you know, it's everything. Like that's when you know you have the meeting out of the palm of your hand, right? Um, Jeff, I'll pitch it over to you. Is there one sketch note that jumps out to you right now? I think the one that you, the one, I love the activity you did and, and the one that you shared just a couple of days ago with your students around this idea of reflecting, right? And getting yeah. kids to put pen to paper and really be thinking about who am I as a learner? How am I going through this process? I love that idea. And to your point, you know, you're an ELA teacher and ta-da, there it is. And it's, it's kids really working on the metacognitive side of things. I think we were talking about this earlier today with the group of teachers, Trisha and I were, that when we feel like that, what you were talking about earlier is like, we get this, this idea that I've got to speed up, right? That I'm behind. Yeah. And when, when we get into that mindset, one of the first things that drops off of a teacher's plate is the idea of reflection and metacognition yeah. because it takes time. And so we, we push it aside to cover more content. And yet that is what I like to call closing the loop, right? You have to do that in order to close the learning loop before you can move forward. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I just love that idea of reflection. Yeah, you know, reflection is a muscle we need to flex in learning. Uh, I love thinking routines. Again, I referenced Ron Richard a couple of times. You know, one, one thinking routine I love is I used to think that and now I think this. And I love it, that reflection, you know, where was your learning yesterday or a week ago or a month ago? Let's look at that portfolio and talk about it. And then tell me how your thinking has changed. You know, we do a lot of co-assessment, self-assessment in my classroom. And I love to use a three point scale, like a three, I got it, I'm good. Like I, I'm strong in this area, I feel competent. Maybe there's a little bit of room to grow, but I'm pretty darn good. Two is so, so, you know, I know my next steps and I know I can get to a three. And one is, as we like to call, meh, like meh, no good. And, and I write those three uh, numbers on the board and I ask students to self-assess whatever it is we're learning about, uh, whatever the work is or wherever the learning is, give yourself a three, two or a one then give that document, whatever we're doing to a peer and ask them to do the same thing, three, two, one, then compare your numbers and see if they di are different. And then, and then see if your thinking has changed. And some of my kiddos say the uh, most amazing things. Like I used to think I was a two because, and then they look at the rubric, they look at the language and they talk about why they thought the assessment was this. And then they say, but my, my, my friend over here assessed me and he thought I was a three, and now my thinking is this, and then they go deeper into the rubric. It's like a Jedi mind trick, right? It's like, I spend 10 minutes on a thinking routine, getting you to do some hard work on your learning. And this is what comes out. Like, why do I need the test when they've just documented their understanding in such a beautifully engaging and articulate way? So I, I do think thinking routines are the things that we spend a little bit of class time doing that have great bang for our buck. Like talk about enduring mindsets. Some of those thinking routines are really, really powerful. I want to introduce you to another one before we transition. Jeff, how are we doing for time? Can you give me a heads up before you'd like me to close off shop for the Q&A? Yeah, we're all right. If you maybe another five minutes or so. Perfect. That's excellent. Thank you. So this is another piece of the inquiry process. It's called a provocation. And provocations are things we bring into the classroom to spark that wonderment in our students, right? You know, we can bring in videos or artifacts or uh, GIFs. I say GIF, you say GIF, we can still be friends. You can bring in, you know, a striking photograph or image, you know, field trips or provocations. When we take our kids into nature, we see that light go off. And, and so provocations are things that are highly planned and intentional. And the purpose is to have our curriculum come to life for our kiddos. So. Our curriculum isn't something we cover. Like we got to get through this. We got to go. It's something we explore and we discover through the lens of a provocation. And I want to share with you just a few simple provocations. And I'm going to share with you a thinking routine that I use when I introduce a provocation. So let's say you're in my class, you're at your desk. And I say, kiddos, I'm going to show you a provocation right now. It's a little video. It's a GIF. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to write down three things. So the first thing I want you to write down is, what do you notice? Write down all your noticings as you're looking at this provocation. The second question is, what do you wonder? What questions do you have? What are you curious about when you see this provocation? And the third one is, what do you know? Like write down any prior knowledge or 
anything that you know in your gut you're seeing there. So I'll show you one provocation here. Oh, and it's not my Instagram, but this is where I house provocations, friends. Go to my Instagram, find me way up here at the top. I'm curating provocations. I post one a week, uh, uh, you know, pretty consistently. Find the provocations I'm sharing at my Instagram. But here's one provocation that I shared out. It's a math provocation. No, it's not a black screen, but have a look at this GIF and something's happening here. And so I would ask students, what do you notice? Write down all your noticings. And they would say things like, well, I noticed that as more of the dots are being added, there's a pattern and it looks like there's a rhythm, there's a consistency. You know, what do you wonder? Well, how is this happening? Is this timed? Are the intervals all the same? Are they going to stop? And then the what do you know is, well, maybe they know something about this. Like maybe they know the math here. Maybe they know the geometry here. Maybe they know the language here. So before I even get into the mathematical concept, I'm exploring that concept through the lens of trying to spark their curiosity. So imagine this, they document that thinking. What do you notice? What do you wonder? What do you know? And then for the next week, I do some teaching and some learning should happen, right? And then after that week, I show them this provocation again. And I say, what do you notice? What do you wonder? What do you know? Those two documents should be drastically different if my teaching impacted their learning. You know what I mean? Like the language they use in the second document and that thinking routine should be quite different than the first one that I sparked their curiosity in. So provocations should have legs. They should have shelf life so that you could revisit them later on after some learning has occurred. Here's another one. I love this one. I often ask my students the same thing. What do you notice? And so this isn't math. This is maybe biology. I noticed that these are fish. They're moving together. I noticed that it looks like they're going to the bottom of the ocean and they're doing something down there. I noticed that although they're not one fish, they're kind of behaving like one fish. And then the what do you wonder is, well, why are they behaving this way? What are they doing at the bottom of the ocean? I noticed they're all kind of taking turns getting to the bottom of the ocean, but what are they doing? And then what do you know? There's going to be one student who says something like, well, I know that's not a group of fish. That's a school of fish. I know that the reason they're behaving this way is because uh, when they behave as a, a unit, they, they appear bigger to predators. And so predators are like, like, less likely to attack them. Uh, maybe one amazing kid says, I, I, I have a hunch that they're going to the bottom of the ocean to eat and they're taking turns eating. Like, how neat is that? So before I even look at biology, before I even introduce the fish that we're going to dissect, right? I hook them through the lens of curiosity. And, and this is a beautiful one, isn't it? Like, you know, think of a student who, who in, in that moment, they, they give you that wow, that wow face. Like, you know, you have them captured through a provocation. I, I chose this provocation because it's in our curriculum, right? I'm choosing the provocations because I'm looking at our curriculum thinking, how can I have our curriculum come to life? This is another cool provocation. This, uh, this is a competency, a competency of critical thinking or creativity. This is a good one for creativity. And I often show my kids this one because they anticipate the mouse is going to go through the maze and something is going to happen. But what actually happens, it's totally different. So kids would say, well, I think the mouse is going to go through the maze and they see the mouse actually climbs up. And this is where all the kids laugh. They're like, ha, ah, that's awesome. And you know, if I value competencies and dispositions in my classroom, I need to value the students who do this kind of thing in the classroom, right? Those creative kids who think outside the box, who kind of are a little bit, you know, the anarchists, but you, you want to value that and you want to show them that that competency, that behavior is actually something that we want to harness and we want to sharpen and we want to hone. So, you know, pr provocations could be curricular focused or they could be competency focused. And so what a great way to introduce the competency of creativity to our kiddos than through a provocation such as this. Again, the thinking routine. What do you notice? What do you wonder? What do you know? I'm just gonna minimize here and I just wanna go to one of my final slides. And it's this one here. And you know, going back to those barriers of inquiry, uh, of implementing inquiry in the K to 12 setting, I, I do encourage teachers that I share with, that I speak to, that I work with, to be inquirers. You know, if we want inquiry for our kiddos, we have to model that. We have to ask big questions of our teaching. 
We have to be curious about our teaching and how effective we are in our inquiry teaching. I encourage you to observe your kids, like get them talking and, and recognizing where the curiosity is. Notice where that wonderment is and then lean into it. Like when you see through a provocation that the curiosity is bubbling in a student, that's not the distraction, that's the thing. You know, we need to go into that and help our students recognize that that curiosity is actually something that's not just pretty fantastic, it's also a part of our curriculum. And we're the curricular experts. How do we make the connection between that curiosity and our curriculum? It, partly it's through those mindful provocation decisions. So uh, lastly here, just my final contact info. I, I, knew, I know I threw it in the chat earlier. Find me online, Twitter, Instagram, and my website. And uh, Jeff, I'll minimize my screen here. We'll come back to gallery view. There we go. And I'm coming back to you here. How's that look on your side, Jeff? Perfect. You're muted. Looks great. <laughs> there we are. Yeah, it looks really good. Yeah, thank you so much. I just put your contact information in the chat again. We'll make Appreciate sure it's also that. in the podcast and everything when people, uh, if they can reach out to you. Uh, we do have, uh, there is one question over in the, over in the Q and A and it's, and I, I love this question as a librarian. So uh, Megan left this question. She said, I'm a K-12 librarian and I'd like to help my teachers do inquiry with their students. Where might I start as a librarian? Where yeah. would you recommend? So first of all, teacher librarians are inquiry allies. They're superheroes in our school. I don't just mean that because I'm stroking your ego. I, I, I utilize my librarians so much. I've seen some really successful things done in two ways. Obviously, that research phase and helping students sharpen that research phase and that skill set and creating a research scope and sequence across our school. So at grade four, the research skills look like this. But by the time they're in grade seven, those research skills should look like this. So every teacher, when a student comes into their room, knows what research skills are coming into the room. So that's one kind of overarching way teacher librarians can support inquiry in schools. Another way to be quite honest is, uh, and, I've, and I'm only saying this because I've witnessed it have do, done by amazing uh, teacher librarians is teacher librarians just take the kids and say to the teachers, watch me, like observe me. I'm, I'm gonna lead this lesson. I'm gonna model this questioning technique or this provocation or you know this reflection exer exercise on student agency. And you just sit back, Jeff, you just watch me do what I do. And, and you know we can talk about it later. And you know what that does for Jeff or that colleague who's watching? It's like, oh, that's how it's done. I could, I could do that without the teacher library next time. And then that's that capacity. The teacher, the next time they roll out that unit or that experience, they've watched it happen. They can do it after. And then maybe they come for you for something else. Like, you know, that questioning technique was great. Can you help me with that authentic piece thing that, you know, that you were referring to? Can I watch you do that? You know, when we make things easier for our teachers, they come knocking on your door. Uh, I've also seen teacher librarians create provocations for different classrooms. Like, oh, Jeff, I know you're working on biology. I've got this great provocation for you. Can I show it to you? And Jeff's either going to say like, yeah, or he's going to say, can you just teach it for me? Can I just watch you do that? And either way is a win, right? So if we can make it easier for our staff to bring this work in, it's in those three capacities, making the research phase easier. So all those kiddos that are coming into our classrooms have a common skill set, and we all know what's coming. Uh, teach for teachers and have them model for you, and then create some resources for them so they can do this hard work, this good work in their classroom. So that's a great question, Jeff. I'm glad that that was raised in the chat in the Q&A. Yeah. The other one I was just wondering, like you talk a lot about, and I love the idea of using provocations. I'm huge into that as well. Um, and you, you showed a couple animated gifts and I've, like one of the things that springs to mind for me is like using something like Google earth, like kids can yeah. travel the world and you can have, you can zoom kids into an Island or to a coast or to a river, or like, you know, and, and really start to ask questions around. What do you see? What do you notice? What do you want to know about an area? Are there other resources that are just simple, the go-tos for you? Oh God, well, like I'm in my office here and I had this hanging and, and you know, this is a beautiful Maori mask. Can you guys see that? Mm -hmm. Like, isn't that gorgeous? That's gorgeous. And this would be like an artifact that I, I would bring to school and I would place it down at a table and I'd say, what do you notice? What do you wonder? What do you know? And I'd encourage kids pre-COVID to come up and, and touch it and like feel the grain, feel the carving, you know, even smell it, right? Like really investigate, you know, one symbol I have in my classroom is a magnifying glass. And I look corny as heck, I got to say, but <laughs> I hold it up and I say, let's get critical here. Let's get investigative. I want you to be inquisitive. 
And I want you to really be interrogative of what you're seeing here and what you're thinking is when you're touching this. And so artifacts are great. Like I've got a closet full of stuff that looks like junk, but it's not junk. It, they're the really rich things that you can bring in. You know, I utilize social media all the time for provocations. Like I'll throw out a tweet and I'll say, anybody got a provocation for this concept of identity or equity or, you know, social injustice? And before I know it, someone's given me something amazing. Uh, you know, I just saw someone tweet out something and it's actually out of Washington state. It's called the before project. Have you guys seen this film, the before project? No, boom. It's amazing. <laughs> it's, a, it's like a 30 minute short film documentary where the interviewer is interviewing kiddos. It's their last day of grade six. And oh, wow. he's asking them, how are you feeling? Like, how's life? And they're, they're great questions, open-ended questions. And it really portrays, uh, you know, the diversity of the kids of which we work with and we serve. And it really, as a parent, my mind was blown. As an educator, my mind was blown. And that was something that I tweeted out maybe a week ago. I said, I'm looking for something to help me build empathy with my grade 12s. And this guy said, watch this short film because your grade 12s are gonna look at themselves as 11 year olds, grade sixes and say, wow, how far I've come or maybe how far I haven't come. And right. so, you know, social media is just a fantastic one. That one was called the Before Project. It's free, you Google it. The, 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 the short film is right there on their website. Um, and I'm also a big Flipgrid fan, Jeff. You heard me reference Flipgrid. I love connecting with educators from around the world. In my travels, I house conversations in Flipgrid, but also it's such a neat way for us to broaden the conversation. If there's a classroom in Johannesburg looking at identity and we're looking at identity and it's in the middle of their night when we're in class, let's have that conversation in Flipgrid. And uh, the world is truly a, a flatter place now. We can easily connect. We can easily, uh, you know, it's equitable, these conversations. Flipgrid's free. Right. Yeah, so it's amazing. Uh, those, yeah. Google Earth is one. I love the G Suite whole family. Talk about equity. Um, but yeah, Google Earth is another one. I'm glad you brought that one up, Jeff. Yeah, cool. Trisha, anything from you? Well, I'm just thinking, you know, what I like about this is, you know, the difference between sometimes our our physical capacities, like if you're a coach or a PE teacher, we never tell students jump higher and expect that they just do that, right? Like we scaffold that. And I do think Unfortunately, I feel like I have heard that idea of like, get curious. Mm -hmm. And what does yeah. that mean, right? Like <laughs> yeah. we have to explain, like, what are the things that you do? What does curiosity in motion actually look like? You know, and I'm thinking, I love that there was that question about what can a librarian do? And, and Trevor, that you started this by talking about, you know, schools that have great PL libraries, that can make a big difference. Um, I put it in the chat. There was a recent book that came out. It's called You're Not Listening, What You're Missing and Why It Matters by Kate Murphy. And she sort of goes into this whole thing, uh, you know, about how we can listen better. We can notice more. Um, and I, I think it's, it's great when our PL libraries have a lot of texts that are just blatantly educational, but texts like that, that are about these skills that are so important to our, our personal lives as well as our professional lives, I would say as a librarian, be looking for some resources like that and pull them in. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Trevor or Jeff, if you would remember, it was a book that came out a few years ago about, um, she's a professional art critic and she teaches people how to really look closely mm. um, at, at classical works of art. And she was actually hired by the CIA to get them to see better, to notice wow. details more. And I love that story. So I just, you know, some resources like that, that, you know, again, it's not just get curious, but what does that look like? What is that as a habit? And skills, mm -hmm. right? What are the skills behind being curious? Yes. How yeah. can we practice and Are we it? teaching those, intentionally teaching those? Yep. Yeah. You know, I, I think probably the, the biggest challenge I pitch for, for teachers is to talk less. And, and those who are doing the talking are doing the learning. And what, what are equitable talk structures where you can get all your kiddos talking, where there isn't this fear of failure or judgment or, or you know, recourse. And, and that has to do with psychological safety, right? We know relationships are important. We need to build relationships. We build strong relationships with kiddos and with each other. So there's a psychological safety where they're willing to give feedback and they're willing to accept feedback and they're willing to talk in small groups and they're willing to talk with the larger group. So, you know, I often challenge teachers to talk less and get your kiddos talking more. And then, as you said, Trisha, notice, like vigorously listen, like really listen and make connections for the kids in the room. So when you hear something over here, it's just not an isolation over there. 
you you hold that up. I do it all the time. I say, pause, time out. I want to hold this up over here. Can we revisit this? Let's lift this up so everyone can hear it. And so the kiddos start to get that DOK level four, that synthesis, that connection, because I'm modeling it and I'm coaching it with them. So the language we use is really, really important. And then how we spend time decentering ourselves and talking less to get our kids talking more. That's a mm. huge challenge, but that would be one I hope all of us put in that third pail. Like, I want to take that away. I want to scratch at that a little bit more. I'm going to try to do that more in the coming weeks and months. Yeah, I love that. It's something we've been talking a lot about, like in our trainings today, Portrish and I have been spending all day together today, but uh, you know, we've been in Zoom meetings and it's this really awkward place where we just like, we stop talking and it's quiet <laughs> and we give you think time. And it's really weird because when you're in these Zooms, when you're in a remote type of situation, a minute seems like an hour. If nobody's talking, you're just like, what am I doing here? Yeah. Right. But it's giving that space and allowing space for kids to talk, yeah. for kids to think, uh, for kids to write and reflect. Yeah. And a lot of times we feel like dead space is wasted space instead of looking as dead space as space to grow. Yeah. You know, two things you... come to mind, Jeff, really quick. One is, uh, you know, if we value that, we need to say that to kids. Like I value thinking. And so thinking looks like, and sounds like, and feels like this. So when it happens, that's what I'm hoping for. I value that this will be a culture of thinking, a culture of learning and not a culture of performing. Performances are important. We need to perform in class every so often. We need to put our best foot forward, but I want this to be a culture of thinking and a culture of learning. So I encourage teachers, if that interests you, if that's a value you hold, make it apparent to your kiddo so they see how the behavior that is happening is actually, wow, this is thinking, like the silence is thinking. And, and then the second part that you were referring to, Jeff, and, and I just gotta go back, what was it? You were talking about the coaching, the thinking. Oh, I forget. Uh, it will come back to me. I'm sorry. But I'm you sorry. know, if we want it, if we want it, we need to coach it. Um, mm -hmm. And if we want the thinking, we need to give them some space. Oh, that's what it was. You know, how often do we have calm in class? Like you referenced to that calm space in a Zoom where we just shut up for a minute, right? How often do we have calm in class where kids can just think? And, and not only is that good for self-regulation and finding that, that kind of compass, like centering yourself, but also some really good thinking happens in calmness. You know, I do some of my best thinking over a cup of coffee at 5 a.m. or when I'm lying in bed in that like trance zone when I'm about to fall asleep. Like think of when you're your most calm and think about how everything's kind of, you know, quiet, but the connections are being made. And sadly, I don't think schools are built around calm. Sadly, I think schools are built around, you know, bells and, and noise and the bell goes and everyone moves and, <laughs> And if we can present some time and space with our kiddos, some time and space where we can have them settle into calm and settle into thinking and then reflect, hey, how did that go? Was that worthwhile, kiddos? Was that worthwhile, staff? Should we do more of that? Should we do less of that? Consider that piece of calm that you were demonstrating in your Zooms today, Jeff. Just like, I'm going to be quiet here for a minute. Let's see what happens. Oh, I wish I'd do a better job of demonstrating it. Trisha's the, Trisha does She's amazing at it. She just she she did she does it all the time and, and sets oh, up. All I these think structures. I think you're being you're being too generous. I think you're great at it too, Jeff. But you know, <laughs> it reminds me. And if there's anybody uh, in the session who is a music teacher, maybe you'll you'll know the name of this. But you know, again, pre-COVID, a few years ago, um, there was a, a symphony. I want to say it was in New York, and they decided they were going to do this experiment with their concerts, where they said, folks are going to come in. You've got to get rid of your devices. We're actually going to have you put them in a locker. You're going to sit down. They turned out the lights. There was no noise. You couldn't see anything. It was complete darkness. And they sat there for 40 minutes, complete, just sensory deprivation. And then the concert began. Wow. And they had people talking about just how much more dynamic that experience was you know, and I know we're not going to have our kids sit in the dark for 40 minutes, <laughs> you know, how can we, again, just sort of, again, give them those breaks, that psychological safety piece. I think there's a part of making sure that there is some, some calmness. There is just some pause, right? Like that's, it, it sets a pace, I think, where learning can really happen. Um, and now more than ever, I think mm. students need to just have that moment to catch their breath mm -hmm. and then get back into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the provocation right there. To be honest, Trisha, like what you described with that symphony, I, I want to show that to my kids. Like, I don't know if there's a video, five to 10 minute video, but let's watch that. 
And then what did you notice? What did you wonder? What do you know? And then talk about calm after that. Like what a great lead into that conversation, everything you described. And I don't know if you were intentional with that, but you were laying the table for our learning by describing that provocation. And Jeff and I were like, wow, that is great. We were yeah, in it. Awesome. And so yeah. that, that is the provocation to these big ideas. And it's through collaboration like this where these provocations kind of surface for us. So I'm thankful you, you raised that one for me. I'm going to do some digging and bring that to my kiddos in the next few days. I think I want to say the New Yorker did a, a big piece on it. And they had some people talk about how they found the first like 10 or 15 minutes of it were like agonizingly difficult. Yeah. And a lot of people saying like I had not actually been separated from my device for that period of time yeah. in yeah. years. And I yeah. thought that was really interesting too. Yeah, yeah that's so fascinating. Good. So that's good. fascinating. Trevor, thank you so much for spending time with us. I know you are a busy, uh, busy man. And uh, much like me, you're probably really excited that you're not traveling all the time, but there's a little part of you that misses it. Uh, you miss not, not going out and being, being in different places. Uh, I'm feeling that way too. Part of me is loving spending time at home, but uh, there's another part of me that's like, oh my gosh, I'm starting to itch for travel, which is an interesting place to be. So I appreciate you taking time out. I know you're, you're busy as well and being here with us and giving us some things to think about. Again, all of, um, all of the ways that you can reach out and, and find Trevor's stuff. I, I put a direct link to where you can download those school posters uh, on his website as well, as long as, as long, along with his Twitter account, Instagram account, where you can follow and, and find more stuff. So Trevor, thank you so much again for being here, for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, check out the books and we will find a way to get that bit.ly link out yeah, people. let's do that. I was just going to say, that, Jeff, yeah. you know, after this, I'm going to send you something and we'll, we'll get that out and we'll leave it up for a span of time rather than just right here, right now. I know there are so many educators who are going to watch this after the, the yeah. fact. So if we can leave it up, that would be great. And, you know, I have a kind request. Can we do a, a, a photo? I'm going to do a screenshot of a photo. Can yeah. we like do like a wave? <laughs> I'm, I, you know, I, I'm not going to shake my hand. So that's really wavy, but thank you so much. I'm going to do another one. Yeah, that was good. Did you hear it? That was great. Yeah. Oh yeah. Ka-ching. I heard yeah, it. That was totally. a moment in time. Thank you awesome. so much, both of you incredible hosts. And uh, I love what you all are doing. And, and just from the bottom of my heart, thanks for the invitation for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah.